Okay, so 16 of you fearless sons and daughters of Anzacs, apparently unafraid to have your position on this and that scrutinised publicly today, cameras on, trousers off, check. It would be kind of rude, therefore, not to do this. I'm John Hogan from AutoExpert.com. You and I get new cars cheap. But Australia only. Website. Card. The education system obviously does have a fair bit to answer for, but I can't help but think that some of this is attributable to our intrinsically convict origins. We'll get into all of that in just a second. Some of you do have very interesting takes on this and that. It's almost as if the facts don't matter. Go figure. But first, this video is sponsored by Bluetti. If you need portable power or home battery backup, Bluetti has a solution for you. I routinely use two Bluetti systems here in the Fat Cave, a super portable EB55 to charge the camera batteries and run the studio lights, thus avoiding a rat's nest of extension cords out on the floor. The AC200 Max is under the workbench right now. It is portable and grunty. It'll run 240 volt power tools and electronics. It's a real alternative to a hardwired dual battery setup for a vehicle. I stick it in the ute all the time. You can swap it from vehicle to vehicle. You can put it in the van, take it camping, put it in the boat, whatever. If you've got a shed without power out the back somewhere, this is the easiest way to get functional 240 volts into it without the noise of a generator. And here's the biggest Bluetti I have ever tested, the new AC. 500. It's a proper modular home battery backup inverter system that functions as an uninterruptible power supply if the grid goes down. It'll supply up to 5 kilowatts of power and you can add up to 18 kilowatt hours of battery storage. Click the link above to watch the Metalwork Mayhem test I recently did on the AC500. Spoiler alert, it even runs a stick welder. That's real electrical grunt. All these Bluetti units use quality lithium iron phosphate batteries, good for 3,500 cycles, pure sine wave inverters for proper 240 volt AC power, and there are numerous USB outputs and 12 volt DC plus inductive charge pads for portable devices. Australia is a real priority for Bluetti. The company will shortly open its local support office in Sydney and there are big Black Friday discounts available right now until the 30th with savings up to $1,500 on some units. I've used about 12 different Bluetti products now and never once had a hiccup. They work great in the shed, in the boonies and for home backup if the grid goes down. Links in the description, and remember, the Black Friday deals wrap up on Wednesday. Thanks to Blue Eddie for supporting the channel and helping to make reports like this one possible. Okay, so many of you to do today, so to speak. So little time. Let us get right into it. Raymond Rickwood first. Thank you very much for your contribution, on Raymond. Oh, John, great video. When do you think the car manufacturers will explain to the public about thermal runaway in EVs that have lithium batteries. It's very difficult off the bat to read some of these as written. The interesting punctuation, the pauses where they need not be. It's a real challenge. Thanks, Raymond. I'd suggest that, yeah, lithium ion batteries do have a unique failure mode, which would be catastrophic thermal runaway. Catastrophic thermal runaway in a nutshell, if you have a defect or a fire or some event that creates the wrong conditions for the battery, like the management system fails or you get a puncture because you're in a crash, puncture of the battery module and a big chunk of metal goes through it and shorts something out, then you can have exactly the wrong evil Goldilocks conditions to heat things up and cause the electrolyte in the battery to start to decompose. And when it does that, it decomposes exothermically, creates its own heat 
and it decomposes in part into oxygen gas. So you've created an event that generates its own heat and its own oxygen gas, which is just right if you want a big fire. And the thing about these fires is they can't be put out, right? Because normal fires, you fight them by depriving the combustion event of atmospheric oxygen. This would be how you fight a gasoline fire. You put foam on it or something, and that stops air getting to it, fire goes out. Can't do that with a battery because it's manufacturing its own oxygen and getting hotter and hotter and hotter. So essentially that fire just keeps going until the materials are exhausted, which is different. But it's not a real challenge for you, okay? It's a real challenge for emergency services. And I'd put it to you like this. If you're driving along, it doesn't matter what the power source is in your car. It could be combustion. It could be battery. It could even be a hydrogen car of the future. And if you look up in the rear vision mirror and you see all of a sudden that you're James Bond and you're issuing a smoke screen and only you're not being chased in a car by a odd job with his razor hat, you've got a problem. And what you've got to do is very clear, okay? You've got to stop somewhere safe secure the vehicle so that it won't just roll away into the freeway. So park, handbrake, wheels to the curb. If you've got kids in the car, nice idea to evac the kids and get everybody to a safe distance, like 100 metres away from the car or something, and then call emergency services. It doesn't matter what the power source is. Then it's their problem. Okay, so I don't think users of cars need particular training about the dangers of batteries, but certainly emergency services do. And I'd furthermore suggest that the problem with the Western world, if there is a problem, like it's mainly a huge advantage, but occasionally it's a problem. It's the proximity to stored or acquired energy. Because to me, with a combustion car, it's a friggin' miracle that every combustion car on earth does not just burn to the ground twice a week. It just is because you've got massive airflow and you've got a whole bunch of heat and you've got a whole bunch of combustible materials and pro tip in the back is 55 litres of Molotov cocktail. So the only thing protecting us from that is all of the engineered systematic protections around that stuff, separating the flammable materials from the hot exhausts, for example, using best practices for wiring and things of that nature, having safe handling of fuel from the point of decanting at the fuel station to going through the tank and the fuel system and into your engine. That's the only thing stopping Molotov cocktail disasters a go-go out there on the road. Pro tip, New South Wales has about... I, th I forget, we must be about a quarter of the population of Australia, something like that. And there are roughly 3,000 vehicle fires that Fire and Rescue New South Wales attends every year. So 60 a friggin' week. That's a lot of cars just burning to the ground for various reasons, you know, dodgy wiring that people do in the backyard and, you know, crashes cause a lot of fires and other events, sometimes it's a vehicle defect, whatever. Okay, so there's already 60 cars a week burning to the ground, and that's just for like a quarter of the population. It's quite a common thing. So not such a big deal for owners of EVs, but a real big deal for emergency services, because when they get there, they're going to have to employ different firefighting procedures to get to the bottom of the problem. Now, Jeremy Hall, John, love your work and your arrogant asshole attitude. That's a compliment. Great stuff, dude. Well, thank you very much, Jeremy. I, I do strive to achieve maximum asshole. It's a real goal, but for a perfectionist like me, it's also a curse because it, it's one of these ideal concepts. Maximum asshole is up here. It's like the Everest that you can never summit and all you can do is strive to get slightly higher up the mountain every time, dude. But um, thanks very much for noticing. Alex Robinson now on the Pathfinder, the most cynical vehicle upgrade I've seen recently, I'd have to say. Same old super thirsty, quasi-undrivable shipbox, outdated V6 engine. This is Alex's unsolicited comment there. Test drove it last week. I did have one on order. 
It was like driving a four-year-old car. That's being generous in my view. It was blah. The engine needed high RPM in order to deliver acceptable acceleration, no different to my 2010 CX-9. Oh, cancel the order. Yeah. I think it's one of the most uninspiring upgrades. Cynical is the word, right? That car. And they're talking it up like it's such a big difference thing to its predecessor, it's going to de the uh, the reputation of the Pathfinder, which they sullied for at least a decade. I'm not seeing it. I'm just seeing a nice cosmetic job on the same old platform with the same old shipbox engine, and I can absolutely not justify why you would objectively buy one compared with the competition at the same price point. I just can't. Garfield Smith now on the same subject. The Nissan Pathfinder has lost its way again. Front end and roof line look like an ugly Range Rover. Yeah. That's right, dude. The new Pathfinder, it does have that sort of darker floating roof like the Rangey, doesn't it? And that rear pillar, I think they've tried to make that disappear a little bit too. It's got all the downsides of authentic Range Rover ownership, doesn't it? But... It doesn't have the insufferable rich twat entitlement, so who doesn't want that, I'd suggest. Darren North now. Lol, had a laugh. Nissan advert played while watching this. To which I would retort, yay, algorithm, well done. Multi-million dollar YouTube ad placement AI succeeds again. If you're worried about AI and its capacity to do a Skynet takeover the world, destroy the world as we know it in the manner of uh, paperclip maximizer, then uh, I think we're in reasonably safe hands, don't you? But you should look up paperclip maximizer. It's a thought experiment about artificial intelligence and how a seemingly benign experiment, uh, an, an assignment given to an artificial intelligence could basically result in the destruction of the world as we know it. It's, uh, it's quite interesting. Look it up. Paperclip Maximizer, if you'd like to get something worthwhile out of, uh, forgotten already, Darren North's experience of the Pathfinder report recently. Dean Pearson now. Do you need Google to find a massage therapist? I just walk outside and open me eyes. Well... Move over, Hercule Poirot, son. Well done. Just using those powers of observation to find the nearest massage parlor. I'm sure Mrs. Pearson is going to be overjoyed to learn that. It could be time, therefore, perhaps to go to Peters of Kensington and buy that lockbox for the kitchen knives that you've always wanted. We've all been there, dude. Yig Drasil now. Nice name. Strong possibility that ICE vehicles will be worth the same as Kodak cameras and Nokia phones, i.e. virtually worthless, within the next five years. Please respond to this comment in your next reaction. Please, if you can, John. Okay. Yig. I'd suggest that's bullshit, dude, because let's look at it like this. If 50% of all new car sales for the next five years, starting next year, are EVs, okay? That's like 500,000 cars times five years equals two and a half million new EVs on the road. And I think you'd agree that's probably pretty much la-la land stuff right there, dude. If that is the case... Two and a half million out of 15 million, that's one in six new cars would be EVs. And we'd be displacing another half a million combustion cars kind of thing. I don't think that's disruptive enough to cause the value of internal combustion cars to plummet in that manner. And let's not forget that uh, there would still be, therefore, about 12.5 million combustion cars on the road. So the uptake of EVs is going to be gradual. It can't be any other way. And Like, just have a look at the way Hyundai and Kia are both going with their onslaught of electric vehicles, if that's the right word. The worst-selling vehicle 
in Hyundai's lineup is the Ionic 5. And the worst selling vehicle in Kia's lineup is the EV6. And sure, that is supply constraint, but there's no EV available right now that is even 30 or 40 grand. Like, that is a big impediment for acquisition for a lot of people. You know what's made uh, MG so popular? All of a sudden, MG is a top 10 car maker. It's because they're selling the MG3 for like 17 and a half grand or whatever it is. And the ZS is one of the cheapest sort of small to medium SUVs that money can buy. The price is a real impediment to the acquisition of EVs. And that's not changing anytime soon. Just saying. David Falk. Now, I bet he can fight. Well, I do appreciate your knowledge and insight on all subjects on which you opine. I generally laugh so hard and wipe so many tears that I forget the subject of the video I'm watching. Perhaps stand-up comedy is in order and forget all the car crap. Yeah, maybe. I am getting a bit sick of the car crap, frankly. Like, another day, another car crap. But I'd suggest <laughs> there's a big difference between doing stand-up and just making funny observations about a subject, okay? And here it is. Like, humour is hard work. That is why almost none of the other car reviewers in Australia is funny. It's because they don't have what it takes to be funny. Like, look at people who are properly funny, like John Stewart and Stephen Colbert and people like that. They're, a, they've got a team of writers working for them on every show, and B... They're just freaks at being really good at pauses at the right time and delivery at the right time and things like that, right? So it is properly difficult to be funny, whereas it's properly child's play to be just a reporter. And most reporters are even shit at that, so they haven't got a hope in hell of being funny. So there's that. But I'd suggest that the gulf that separates someone like me from a proper stand-up comedian is this, right? If you're a stand-up comedian, you're going to go out on stage, and this is the toughest gig of all time, because you've got to go out on stage in front of a bunch of people who expect you to make them piss themselves, Okay, so that expectation is already there. Most people who watch my stuff, they expect a few laughs while they learn something, which is a much lower bar in the comedian spectrum. So there's that. I would be properly terrified of giving stand-up a go, like properly terrified. And even when you listen to uh, Jerry Seinfeld and people like that, he did a great episode of Comedians in Cars Getting Coffee with Eddie Murphy and they talked about that stuff a lot. And they both talked about the times when they were all at comedy clubs and they just fucking bombed, right? And would that not just gut you? Like you're trying to be funny and not a laugh, like deafening silence in front of a big crowd of people who've expected you to be properly funny. And they've both experienced that and they are two of humanity's absolute elite comedians, right? So humor's hard, dude. Stand-up would be the men's 100-metre sprint Olympic grand final of comedy. It really would. Anyway, now let's do something a little bit more serious Anom Amos, who says, carbon dioxide is not a deadly poison. Dog's dick. Any gas that is in high enough concentration to exclude oxygen from being inhaled will kill you. First statement, absolutely incorrect. Second statement, absolutely true. Like, here's what they do. If you're in a oil refinery and you've got a weld the inside of a tank that normally contains petrol. That's a pretty interesting assignment when you think about it because it's very hard to get rid of the explosive vapour. So what they typically do in uh, potentially explosive environments where you've got a weld is they pump nitrogen gas into the environment. They displace everything with nitrogen gas. And of course, nitrogen is mainly what you're breathing now. The air you breathe is 78% nitrogen. And the reason they do that is because nitrogen is not toxic, but 
it displaces the oxygen and therefore if there is any latent vapour inside the tank, it can't burn when exposed to a source of ignition, i.e. welding spark, okay? Nitrogen is chosen because it is not toxic. The problem with nitrogen is that if you have a defect with your breathing apparatus, like you wear glorified scuba gear to do this in industry, it's a pretty dangerous job. The, um, the problem is if you have a problem with that breathing gear and you start breathing the environment in the tank, you can't tell that it's not air. And the only problem is you're not breathing any oxygen and it all feels okay until you're dead, okay? So the displacement of air with other gases is a thing and that can certainly happen with CO2 but I'd suggest that CO2 is also a deadly poison and there doesn't have to be that much of it in the air to do that. We'll go on with Anom's comments here. Now he says carbon monoxide is a deadly poison. It is. It can cause brain damage even in small concentrations and death in only slightly higher amounts. That's true also. This is due to it binding to the red blood cells in preference to oxygen. That's true. Considering we exhale carbon dioxide in higher concentrations than it would take carbon monoxide to kill you. That's true. Anyone who says CO2 is a deadly pollutant or poison is either a liar or an ignorant climate alarmist. That's absolutely false, dude. Like... And don't take my word for it, all right? Let's listen to what the US government's National Library of Medicine has to say about that. Now, I realise that CO2 is highly politicised at the moment. There's some people who want to go looking for any reason to make CO2 completely benign. But if you got 100 engineers and chemists all together in the room, they would all tell you that CO2 is a deadly poison if there's enough of it in the air. And there can be more than enough oxygen to breathe and CO2 will kill you. The mechanism is not unlike the way carbon monoxide kills you. US government's National Library of Medicine. At higher concentrations, CO2 leads to an increased respiratory rate, tachycardia, cardiac arrhythmias and impaired consciousness. Concentrations greater than 10% may cause convulsions, coma and death. That's 10% in air. Okay, That's according to the US government's National Library of Medicine. If you'd like something more relatable that proves to you that CO2 is a deadly poison, Watch the Tom Hanks version of the movie Apollo 13, okay? That's pretty historically accurate. And the problem was that they had to do this imminent rejig. They lost their fuel cell because the liquid oxygen tank exploded and therefore they were down on electricity. They had to retreat to the LEM to do their almost but not quite free return trajectory around the, the moon because that's how they got home. And... The problem, once they did the electrical management, because electric use of the whole system was a problem because they lost the fuel cell. But the other problem, and to some extent it was a greater head fuck for the engineers back in mission control, the problem was that they were going to die of CO2 poisoning. There was more than enough oxygen in the air to sustain them, but they were exhaling CO2, which was building up in the spacecraft. And because they had to go to the LEM, the LEM and the command module had CO2 scrubbers in them. And every submariner on Earth can relate to this because the same problem happens for submariners. You've got to scrub CO2 out of the air when you're submerged. And you do it using lithium hydroxide, which absorbs CO2. You blow the air through these lithium hydroxide filters and it collects the CO2. The problem with Apollo was that one contractor made the CO2 scrubbers for the LEM and a different contractor made a completely different CO2 scrubber for the command module and the, the two scrubbers were not interchangeable. The canisters couldn't be easily interchanged. So they had to adapt the one canister. They had to get the square peg of this canister into the round hole of that canister. And they put a whole bunch of brainiacs in a room and they locked them in the room with just the shit that the astronauts had to scrub the CO2 out of the air by adapting square peg to round hole. Okay, They would not have had to do that if CO2 was not a deadly poison because there was plenty of fucking oxygen in the atmosphere in the spacecraft to sustain them. It was going to be death by CO2 poisoning, which is different to death by CO2 
asphyxiation. Certainly in places like caves and mines and other sump-like environments, big tanks and stuff like that, CO2 can fall into them and because it's heavier than air, it can form a lake down the bottom. And if you go down into it, it'll displace the air. There'll be no oxygen to breathe. That's bad for you, okay? We'll go back to what the uh, National Library of Medicine in America has to say on that. They go, carbon dioxide is a colourless, odourless and non-flammable gas that accumulates near the ground. It's 1.5 times heavier than air. These characteristics explain why enclosed environments are vulnerable for CO2 build-up, displacing oxygen from the area. The term confined space hypoxic syndrome has been proposed to describe confined space accidents occurring in water meter pits, tanks, holds of ships, mines, underground storage bins, and so forth, resulting from oxygen-deficient atmospheres. This is a completely different mechanism. This is suffocating from not having oxygen because it's displaced by CO2. They say that carbon dioxide does not only cause asphyxiation by hypoxia, but also acts as a toxicant. At high concentrations, it has been shown to cause unconsciousness almost instantaneously and respiratory arrest within one minute. Okay, so you can uh, believe fake name dude if you want, who seems to think that carbon dioxide is completely benign and can't be demonised in this way, or you can believe an agency such as the US National Library of Medicine. Over to you, dude. Marcello... Sorrentino now. I bet he doesn't sound like that. All in caps too. Must mean it. Auto experts stay within your expertise. Mechanics, you know about as much as anything else as my elderly grandmother. Idiocy is in your blood. I, I spilt a bit of that the other day and I could, I, no idiocy came out. Must still all be in here, dude. I'd suggest that the religious are so intolerant of atheists and those EV evangelising twats are so intolerant of the facts, <laughs> right, car makers, intolerant of scrutiny about their statements and their behaviour. Straight talk, they hate that. Still, I would like to meet Granny. She could be a hoot. Phil Scott now. Enough eye candy, how about a tour of the fat cave, John? Certainly not that, Phil Scott. He hates me. Anyway. <laughs> I'd suggest that can anyone's life be sufficiently empty that a tour of this busted-ass garage that I've kind of half-sexed up as a quasi-film set and slash workshop, is that enough to make one's life, you know more meaningful? Let me know in the comments. I'll do a tour if you want. I just don't see how it could be even vestigially interesting. Anyway, Mind Freeze 083. I am surprised that 82 other people took the name Mind Freeze. These fake name dickheads, honestly. Mr. Cadogan, a lot of Americans are going to hate you after this one. Not that you mind. Now, this is a cardinal sin, Mind Freeze. Men should not emoji. I don't know if Mind Freeze is a man, but if you're a man, don't emoji. Just use the right language to convey the tone. It's not that hard. Come on. I've, I've sampled all the flavours of hate, mind freeze. I really have from around the world. And I'd have to say, American hatred is the smoothest. I love America. Sammy Jammy now. Sammy Jammy. I like that name. Keep making fun of America, Mr. John. That's very formal. I'll make a special trip to Oz and whip that geriatric ass and teach you respect. Oh, don't tease me, Sammy. How much would you charge me for this uh, alleged flogging, Sammy? I wonder if it'd be cheaper than uh, Jim's whoop ass. If it is, you've got a deal. I'll pick you up from the airport. And we'll be flogging before you know it. Silo FX now. You have no idea how much joy I got seeing if there is a borough pub. There is. Well, thank God. The borough pub. News just in, a man in custody after a big hubbub at the borough pub. That borough pub. In other news, 
new report reveals why homicide victims just stop talking to police. And a serial killer reveals how a judge just ruined his reputation. Australian Army vehicle disappears in Afghanistan after being painted with all new camouflage. Apparently it was found by a tree. And Taronga Zoo welcomes a baby panda. That's the news in a nutshell, dude. Like, the news is an inversion of reality. It's why no one watches. Gandalf now. Another serial emoji man. Like, Jesus. John, I hope that cemetery doesn't take you away too soon. You've got at least another 20 years, mate. Some would say a curse, but there you go. Thanks, Gandalf. <sighs> yeah, I guess I still have many more Christmas cards not to receive. Many new car launches not to attend and many industry relationships yet to be terminated. And finally, Grayson Ottaway, who is a bit of a legend himself, actually. He's a former radio host and a good bloke, a long-time watcher of this channel. Grayson says, <clears throat> You're a gosh darn legend, JC. Forget about the second coming. You're already here. I'd suggest, watch that friggin' language, Grayson. Let's just try to keep it clean, shall we? There's a good chap. Of course, this is not the first time that I've been advised to forget about the second coming. Just saying, dude. We've all been there. Anyway, that's what you said to me this week, and that's what I think about it. Don't go diving in a lake of CO2. Just don't do that. If you think mixing a bit of oxygen up in it is going to help, it's not, dude. Carbon capture. Yay, Australia! See you soon.